to me, it's just a kind of evocative poetic image that this, um, you know, kind of sacred feminine, almost like a guiding spirit for one's alchemical work is necessary. Welcome to Sora Mystica, a podcast exploring life's mysteries and magic through its symbols. I'm Mariana Lewis, an archetypal tarotist. And I'm astrologer Christina Farella. And just as the Soror Mystica guided the alchemist through his holy work, we hope to be your mystic sisters in these conversations, guiding you deeper into the symbolic life. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 13th episode of Sora Mystica. 13 is a is a lucky number or an unlucky number, depending on where you are and who you are. Um, but it's an important number for us. And so today we're talking all about the Sora Mystica, um, which is very, very exciting, as all our topics are <laughs> to us, at least. <laughs> um, so we're just going to jump right into it. But I know that you're having... <laughs> you're having a, a tough day today. So why don't you tell me the great things you're reading and that'll make us feel better. Okay. I'll, yeah. Hi everyone. Christina <laughs> is having a rough morning <laughs> due to bureaucratic nonsense and it's okay. I'm going to mm-hmm. get over it really and, soon. And cat scratches. And cat things. things. Yeah. Mm-hmm. My, you know, it's okay. Um, we're, we're taping this right before the full moon. Mm-hmm. And it's happening in my 12th house. And I wonder if some subconscious material is being leaked out into the ether around Mm. me. So I'm going to try to get a handle on that today. Mm -hmm. And yeah, when you said that you're so excited to talk about the Sora Mystica, I was just laughing to myself because I'm pretty sure we start every episode being like, we're so excited. (laughs) (laughs) We're talking about this obscure thing today. It's going to be so fun. So Mm. yes, um, this is great though. And it is exciting to talk about the Sora Mystica and, um, okay. So what I am reading, uh, actually I just finished, I just finished it last night. I've been reading a novel by Colette Mm -hmm. called Sherry and I never read Colette before. I'm actually having a phase where I'm trying to like go back and read novels in, you know, just historical, whatever canon novels. I actually don't think that Sherry is canon at all, but Colette is definitely one of those writers that I've missed in my literary journey because I'm more of like a poem, um, uh, essay person than Mm -hmm. a novel person. And, um, this novel was ridiculous. It's, (laughs) it's just a very long breakup story, um, about a younger man and his much older, like courtesan girlfriend Mm. and it's very French and it was basically like a high literary romance novel, like high quality sentences, amazing translation. I bet it's incredible in French. And, uh, but the content was just hilariously salacious. And I didn't know that before I started. And then I started and I was like, Oh, (laughs) this is what's going on. (laughs) Yeah. Um, so that's what I've been, that's what I've been immersed in. And it actually felt really good to just devour a novel and I'm like looking for my next victim now. So that's Mm -hmm. exciting. Doesn't that feel so good to, to like actually only just indulge in the, the creative Mm -hmm. part of the brain. I know. I feel like we do so such intellectual work, which we love, but then I hit these points where I'm just so burnt out by it sometimes like right now, probably Mm -hmm. I'm reading. I just added a sixth book to my list and I'm 20% into all these books and like can't make any progress. So I keep starting a new one because I just, I'm like burnt out with it. You but, record your progress on Goodreads. Is that what yes, you do? Yes. That's so cute. I have to. Otherwise there's no incentive because I'm <laughs> my, so I don't know if I've mentioned my grandpa on this podcast before, but my grandfather, this, my grandfather is my origin story. He was a very <laughs> smart guy. Um, he, I don't even know what he really did for a living. I think he did. So he had a degree in economics or something with Fordham. I don't know. Um, but I thought he was like a, like a real philosopher that was <laughs> – I didn't know because the way that people talked about him and my family. Um, but he was an armchair philosopher, and he collected at least I – would, I would guess 10,000 books in his lifetime. Like you've seen the um, library, and yeah. that's only a portion of the library. It's massive. Um, and he loved Jung, and he loved Joseph Campbell. Um, and so he had all these books and that's how I, I got onto these people because 
I found them in this house and I was like, this sounds interesting. And and I started reading it and I was like, I love this. <laughs> this is my destiny. And um, he was very, very, just like me, <laughs> he didn't have good reads, but he had index cards. <laughs> And so he kept very detailed notes on every book he bought, when he bought it, how much he bought it for. Um, It was like a full like library catalog card insert thing. It was very professional. And um, he would mark, you know, when he started and finished each chapter. And I would say 90% of these books, he didn't get past chapter one. Just (laughs) constantly picked it up, put it down, bought another one. So I mean, I relate to that. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I do that. So I'm trying really hard to get through some stuff, but I just started yesterday and I'm actually, I'm already 50 pages in, which means it's good. Um, I started The Meaning of Mary Magdalene by Cynthia Bourgeault, I think is how you pronounce it. That might be wrong. Um, But it is I it's it's basically just a book about about how we understand Mary Magdalene and and her actual roots and her actual significance and all this stuff. And so I'm very interested in it because I am going away to France um, Mm -hmm. soon in like what's today? Friday. So I'm going away in a week and I'm going to be in Belgium for a minute and and seeing what Belgium is like. And then I'm going to Paris, which is my home <laughs> in my soul. And um, and then I'm spending a week in the south of France, um, like following the pilgrimage of Mary Magdalene. So amazing. So jelly. Uh, I'm so excited. Um, and it's going to be very good for me. It's very necessary. So, um, dear listeners, our next episode um, maybe a little late <laughs> getting out. So just keep that in mind because I'm on vacay, which is important because mm-hmm. I, I'm, and I'm not, I'm going to try not to work on vacation mm-hmm. too. We'll see if that happens. We'll Probably see. Not. We'll see if you can stop yourself. <laughs> Probably not. You know, the last time I went on vacation, I like launched the architectural terror school, <laughs> like while I was on vacation, which was extremely dumb and like was panicking because I didn't have any cell service. And then it's like, people are like, Hey, I have a question about the thing and not, this is not working. And I was like, Oh my God, <laughs> I'm in Switzerland. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. <laughs> so that was a mistake. I'm trying not to. Um, Anyway, so we're reading good things and we're Mm -hmm. taking good care of ourselves. So let's talk about the Soror Mystica. In our introduction, we do, you know, have a little bit to say about the Soror Mystica and and how it's connected to alchemy. And so it's interesting. I've done research on the Soror Mystica in the past, and it's, it's hard to get some information on her because, you know, it's it's kind of an obscure point in alchemy, but the person who really drew out this word, this term was Jung. Uh, It's not that he made it up. He found it um, in a lot of different alchemical or several different alchemical texts. There's definitely other scholarship out there about it, but it's just not something that like is widely studied or or talked about. But basically what the Sword Mystica is or was, um, was the alchemist would be doing the alchemical work right? He would be trying to turn lead into gold or find the philosopher's stone or whatever his particular, you know, goal was. And he would have sort of like an assistant who would assist him in in the work. And so that was pretty much always, or most of the time, a woman, a young woman um, who would be called the Sora Mystica. And so Jung actually has a little quote about what she is, which is just pretty good. Um, And he says, many of those old philosophers had found out that there is no real philosophy if you don't face the anima. So many of them had a so-called soror mystica, a friend in God, a woman friend. (laughs) So (laughs) how young of young. Um, So basically, if you haven't heard the term anima, the anima is a Jungian idea that is not without its many problems, Um, but basically that there is an inner feminine figure in men and an inner masculine figure in women that's called the animus. And so a key, you know, idea of his psychology is that we're always trying to meet the, the, what he called the contrasexual, you know, archetype within us, meet it and unify with it. And so we find that harmony um, with the basically with divine masculine and feminine within ourselves. And that's kind of a big part of the inner work. And so the Sora Mystica, at least in Jung's theory, 
was this kind of outward, this way of projecting outward, this inner work of seeking that feminine. And so they would kind of consciously bring in a woman into the alchemical space to assist them with the work. There's other scholars um, who rightfully say, well, maybe women were just alchemists. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. How tantalizing. (laughs) Right. Can you imagine? Um, And there's actually pretty good evidence for some of that too. Like uh, one of the people that Jung uh, like calls the Sora Mystica is Maria Prophet. Prophetessa, Prophetessa. Do you, have you do you know about her a little bit? Um, so she's like the one of the most famous female alchemists, and she she's the one. Um, she has, I think, the the a really good quote about like numbers and like the one becoming the two, becoming the three, becoming the mm-hmm. four. It's like a very prominent quote that that like Marie Louise von Franz expounds upon, and and is like a central part of some theories and stuff. Um, but she was just a great alchemist. She and she's pretty old, like. I think more ancient alchemy, not, not Renaissance alchemy. Mm -hmm. And so he calls her a sore mystica, even though she was an alchemist in her own right, (laughs) of course. Anyway, so this is what we think of with the sore mystica. Literally, it means in Latin, the mystic sister. And so her purpose is to be a a soul guide at this kind of opposite force that the alchemist is, is working beside in order to achieve the goal of alchemy, which is, you know, basically in a psycho spiritual sense, it's the uh, unification with the capital S self, like the coming together of all the disparate parts into a unified experience of wholeness. Um, um, So yeah, that's, that's basically what the Sora Mystica is, Mm -hmm. which is, our, the title of our podcast is Sora Mystica because that's kind of what we do. And this is when we were thinking about the, putting together this podcast. That was very much our our hope for it is that we could have these conversations that excite us so much, um, but in doing so, help people in their own alchemical work and bring in those symbols and make sense of them um, and integrate them. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, so there's the Sora Mystica. Yeah, it's such a great concept and something that you brought to my attention. I didn't know about the Sora Mystica before. And I think that it is, um, there's something really beautiful about the kind of, obviously, like the unification of opposites. Um, and we're also taping this in Gemini season. So mm-hmm. I feel like that's like a nice kind of on theme um, sort of symbol for us right now. Um, and I think that what's what's funny is what you mentioned is that the idea that the Sora Mystica is the supporting role that helps the alchemist find the balance or the unification or the whatever, um, Mm -hmm. the sort of transformation within because he needs the anima um, and probably she needs the animus. But there are so many ways that women are independently mystics and independently alchemists and artists, um, and diviners and witches. And so I think that it's, it is a, it's kind of a sweet idea that the Mm -hmm. Sora Mystica comes in and, um, that the alchemist actually can't perform his tasks without her assistance or something would be missing alchemically if she's not there. I think that that's lovely. But I also think that it's probably uh, a recuperation or an integration into the alchemical tradition um, of something that already existed, which was the woman mystic. So Mm -hmm. I think that, but you know, for the Sora Mystica, I know that you said that there's not so much information about her. To me, it's just a kind of evocative poetic image that this, um, you know, kind of sacred feminine almost like a guiding spirit for one's alchemical work yeah. is necessary. Do you, do we know what the job like specifically was of the Sora Mystica? You know, I would guess that because the, the work itself was a lot of trial and error. So I would mm-hmm. imagine that her, her job was probably to keep track of what was going on and to kind of, it was, he, the alchemist was balanced out by her input, right? So it, the work of alchemy can be <laughs> very passionate. So I imagine she was kind of a mediating force to an mm. extent as well and offered a different perspective of how to make the work happen and function. There's like, there's um, references to the Swarm Mystica. That's, they're not called the Swarm Mystica, but there's more references to women as, like helping men and like giving input 
um, helping male alchemists. And sometimes they're assumed that those are their wives or those Mm. are their like sisters or something like that. And that they kind of did this together, but because (laughs) it's patriarchy, they don't get credit. (laughs) So they're the sister, they're the helping sister rather than being the the co-alchemist. Sure. Yeah. Um, How good of them to help. Right. (laughs) (laughs) We're gonna we're we're gonna rise up and, and after this episode and form a matriarchy, <laughs> take down the alchemists. Um, yeah, <laughs> good. <laughs> this is the vibe today, apparently. So it's it fine. It's completely fine. Um, nothing to see here. Well, you yeah. know, it's it's the thirteenth episode. We're in the dark feminine space. It's all yes, it's all good. Yeah. No, I love that you caught that, and it's true. And. Yeah, I think uh, when I was a kid, I remembered like some um, apartment buildings in New York just didn't have a 13th floor on like the yeah. elevator button and stuff. And I'd be like, what? I think that my grandfather's building actually didn't have a yeah. marked 13th floor. And I was yeah. like, that is so odd. What is what is that? And then you learn that because the number 13 is associated with women because we technically bleed 13 times a year. Yeah. Um, and we are bad that you can't have 13 <laughs> we are bad. anything. <laughs> yeah, it is it is absolutely the number of the of the dark feminine and so we're mm-hmm. frightened of it terribly mm-hmm. in Europe they don't have that number anywhere. That is so interesting. Yeah. Well, you know, that's cool. silly. So, I think that that's great. So, <laughs> um yeah, I think that, you know, we are each other's sore mystica, but we don't sure. need the animus necessarily, or maybe we have it. You know, your your the birth of your interest in Jung and alchemy and all that stuff coming from your grandfather's library is very like Athena coming from her father's head Tell me of about you. It. And I think that that's very cute. Um, yep. Yeah. Thanks, Grandpa, wherever you are, mm-hmm. <laughs> up in this, up in the ether. So I think that we, we definitely want to appreciate the work of the assistant, the Sora Mystica as the assistant, the Sora Mystica as the guide. It's almost like a psychopomp figure in a way. I was going to say it sounds like a daimon or something yeah, like that, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so we want to honor that. And we're not even going to get into Jung's idea of the anima because it's just it's just so complex. And, and I think that there's value to what Jung was trying to do. But of course, it's extremely limited in his very patriarchal, semi-misogynistic worldview at the time. So like, we don't even need to get into that. But I think that where we want to focus, because I think that both of us take on that archetypal role as Sora Mystica with each other, yes, and also in literally our work with our mm-hmm. clients and our mm-hmm. students. This is because what we teach is not practical things as much as it is deeply mystical things. Um, and so that that is our function in many ways. And so we're both very inspired by by women of the past who have functioned as our Sora Mystic K. Mm, is that mm-hmm. how you would say it? I think so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah ooh. I took Latin in middle school. Um, so I think that that's kind of where we want to focus today. And I think that we can definitely start with the OG Hildegard, um, mm-hmm. who we mentioned, I feel like every episode, somehow we managed to squeeze, to we squeeze Hildegard her. in. <laughs> We're always just dancing around her. So yeah, I, I would love to talk about Hildegard. And I think that... Um, For those who are listening, you know, and are like wondering, you know, how are we making this leap from Mm -hmm. the symbolic or the historical Sora Mystica figure to other women figures in history, there is a lineage that we can trace from um, this sort of like fantastical image of the Sora Mystica assisting the um, the alchemist um, to write what I mentioned before. These women were likely, and as Marianne also said, uh, mystics or alchemists in their own right. And so looking back in history um, and seeing exactly who these figures were, because it's documented, there are many women mystics of the past, and we just live in a world that prioritizes the weird men and uh, (laughs) gives women this sort of background quality, also making them weird, by the way. but. Um, there is a kind of through line here that is really, really interesting to trace. And if you've never explored this realm of history, or if you're not even aware of the fact that um, there were women who were taking on the role of mystics or seers or translators of spirit and bringing it into either their own divine worship or their art that they were making, um, this is, I think, going to be 
an episode that is exciting. Because I remember mm-hmm. when I first learned about these figures and I was like, oh my God, you know, especially yeah. if you were raised in a patriarchal um, religion or just family system, a lot of priority is given to the male figures of Christianity or yeah. Um, or our dads <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> and women actually are able, of course, to do everything, but in this very, very special and bizarre way, act as these conduits of spirit. So um, yeah, tell us about Hildegard of Bingen. Mm-hmm. So Hildegard, um, I want to say she's, she was from, I think, the 12th century. Mm-hmm. Right. I feel like she's born right at the end of the 11th century and then into the 12th century. I I think so. But Hildegard was this kind of amazing woman who um, she was she was a nun and she lived in an uh, in uh, hermitage. Basically, she was an anchorite um, for many years and she had visions from very early age. Um, And it's so interesting. I read her biography and and. um, these visions she would have would make her terribly sick and she would just be so ill after them. And she didn't understand why she'd be so sick. And then she finally started to share them and to tell people about them and to, and to translate them into something more. And then she started to, to feel better. And then this like illness would lift from her. And when she was in her forties, I think it was her mid forties. She um, had a series of mystical visions that absolutely blew her world apart. Um, And that's where we get the Scivious um, text, which is impossible to read. I have it on my table right now. (laughs) I've I've had it here for like three months and I'm really scared of it because I don't know what to do with it (laughs) because it's massive and it's really, really challenging. Um, But it's basically a series of divine visions of God um, and what God is. And what is so interesting about her is that her visions of God were not that, were not really that much about like Jesus crucified on the cross and like, you know, sin. And I mean, there's that there, absolutely. But it's mostly focused on the nature of God, the nature of the cosmos, the nature of what the divine is. And she, it seems very much like the core of her theology and her mysticism was that God is green. God is greening. God is growth. God mm. is the the fertile life. Um, and so she actually had a very feminine vision of God. Um, and so she did this amazing thing where she had these visions and then she had, I think we discussed this on the, on the pod before, it, whether it was like the other um, nuns or whether it was a, her assistant clerk priest guy i'm not sure but basically they were tramp they were made into into art so they were painted these visions are painted and if you want to do some some shrooms and look at those <laughs> i recommend it <laughs> it's <Nice>. wild <laughs> it's i mean it's very cool because her visions were not like oh i see the universe and everything's perfectly ordered it was like the outer layer is fire inside the fire is love and inside the love is you know endless lightning and it was just like these huge crazy visions of what life was that were so deeply symbolic um and so beyond her time they're very uh, focused on the unity of all things, um, the fecundity of all things. Um, and uh, she also, one of the reasons that we both love her so much, um, was the most prolific composer, woman composer um, of that time period. I don't even know if we have many others. As far as I know, she's the only one I've, I've ever heard of that we mm-hmm. actually have recorded music. I'm sure there are some, but that's the one I know of. Um, and so she wrote beautiful, beautiful antiphons to, you know, taking from uh, scripture and turning it into this gorgeous music. And a lot of it was devoted to God's love and to Mary and to the feminine. Um, and she also ran two monasteries. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so like she was the, the, um, the prioress or the abbess of two monasteries and um was very like familiar with like very high up uh cleric officials in the church and she scolded popes 
told them they weren't holy enough. <laughs> it's like she was wild. And she lived, I think, into her 80s too. Like, and she, oh, and of course, she was also an herbalist, right. a very prolific herbalist. Mm-hmm. Um, and as I have her, her Medica on my shelf. And I have it, it over there so, too, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> just like endless, the, this woman's gifts. Um, and I think that she's, she shepherded, shepherded us both through a lot of different ways, through her music, mm. through her mysticism, through her herbalism. Um, so she's been a big inspiration and she's just absolutely just astounding. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And yeah, so what a great primer on, you know, all of her many abilities and gifts. And I just want to say Hildegard is a zero degree mm. Virgo sun. So she's on my team and <laughs> um, I claim her as my own and she is just such a, a really stunning expression, I think, of that Virgo archetype when it's maybe at its like most high functioning, maybe a little yeah. too high functioning, mm-hmm. because she's able to not only be um, this person who is, like you said, you know, uh, in charge of um, organizations, <laughs> like running mm-hmm. monasteries yeah. and, you know, doing all of that kind of labor, which is community work, which is something that Virgo cares deeply about, yeah. uh, but also her attention to like nature. And I love that idea of the greening of yeah. uh, the world being where God is, because it is, um, I think that that's true. And that always struck me that that was um, the part of the message. You know, to our listeners, you may have seen her paintings. The most famous one is, um, of a cosmic egg. And so, uh, I'm going to make a little bunch, like a little bouquet of art from this episode and share it, um, maybe on our website or something. It'll be, it'll be discoverable Mm -hmm. easily. Uh, but it's just so fascinating to see. I remember there was one of the first ones that I found just online, idly searching for her her work where I'm pretty sure it shows either her or someone else seated and then like a squid yeah, coming so down over her head. It's flames. It's divine oh. flames that have, they have like tendrils. Yes. I want it to be a squid so bad. I know. <laughs> I know. It's crazy. And these tendrils of flame like wrap around her skull. Mm-hmm. That's her. And then her, her guy, I forget his name, but she had, she basically took a priest she just took a guy and was like, you're my scribe now. And so he was like a very loyal mm-hmm. assistant to her for a long time. And I also just love that she had a, a male assistant. Yeah, it's perfect. It's like the inverse of the Sora Miska. It's Basically, so cute. <laughs> yes. Um, so he did a very good job of keeping all her work. And and uh, so that's him in actually in the in the. I see. I know exactly writing. what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Well, anyway, I think that the fact that, you know, because all through time – many saints, right, they become a vessel for God because they have a vision, they have a message, they um, become inspired, like, you know, um, like Joan of Arc or something like yeah. that to like crusade for God and do do all these things. But what makes um, Hildegard different to me is that she translated a lot of those messages into works of art or had the art carried out, you know, yeah. at her direction. Um, and the music too is really, Mm -hmm. really stunning. So I love this idea of taking the influence of the divine and then turning it into poetry or music or painting or something else. And I think that that's what a lot of artists do. Um, if they're tapped into that part of themselves, I know a lot of artists would like roll their eyes at the idea of God and that's, that's their whole thing, which is still being in relationship with the divine, by the way. But, Mm -hmm. um, And, you know, when I think about this tradition, I kind of touched on it before, but then I forgot to complete my thought because it is Gemini time. Mm -hmm. The, um, the kind of maybe formula or framework that this speaks to in myth for me is the concept of Apollo and his Sybil or his prophetess, his Oracle. And he had several, right? So Apollo is the, um, you know, the God of light and music and medicine. And he also has divination as one of his tools or, um, things that he governs. Mm -hmm. That's curious to me because divination is sort of anti-rational and he is the God of the sun, which is a hyper logos and rationality oriented 
piece of the puzzle. And so there's a deeper story there about how he came to be the one who governs divination. But in the ancient world, there were these various temples to Apollo. And if you needed to have someone divine something for you, if you needed the answer to a question, you would take a journey Right today, we just like go on Instagram and find a tarot reader. But you would journey physically <laughs> to I Delphi. <laughs> I wish we still had a journey to Delphi, then people would be serious when they come. Yeah, that's I wish true. I lived in Delphi. Then, then I we could live. Like... In, I was going to say, let's like live in Delphi. Then that's right. fine. People would have to, it's fine. to come to us. And then we I'm not doing anything here. I don't care. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> you would journey there, and then the process of getting the prophecy was pretty terrifying. You would go yeah. into this cave and this woman who was the conduit of the vessel of Apollo would wind up, you know, receiving a transmission, but it would come out really, really garbled. Um, and kind of, I think that there's like a Heraclitus fragment about the, the unhinged babblings of the Sibyl needing to be translated into verse or something like that. Right, and right. right. So there would be actually a scribe there who would take it down, write the prophet, the the prophecy in verse in poem mm-hmm. form and then deliver it to the person. And then you would have your answer. But I think that in terms of the image of the Sora Mystica assisting the, um, the God or the, sorry, the alchemist, we have this interesting analog between the masculine God and then his feminine um, prophetess or Oracle. So just wanted to kind of put that out there because everything has a root Everything has a symbolic root. And I feel like there's a link there that's worth exploring or playing with. Like, where did this idea of the Sora Mystica come from? Yeah. Um, It might be linked to the Sibyls. Well, that that makes me kind of think about Mary Magdalene. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm reading about her right now, about to go on a pilgrimage that is focused around her. Um, and my interest around Mary Magdalene really just comes from the fact that, I mean, I had such a strong Christian background and I, I was really, you know, invested in that faith for a long time. Um, and I left the church because of the lack of the feminine and how uncomfortable that was for me. Um, and I, I think that the more that I encounter Mary Magdalene, the more I'm kind of in shock that, that she's, she's still so unknown. Um, so essentially we think of Mary Magdalene as the repentant prostitute, right? Like that's, that's how she's uh, labeled in the church. And there's actually no, that that's a false thing. And the, just, and this is not debatable. This is a thing. This is a known fact. It was repealed in 1969 that she was ever a, a repentant that's prostitute. <laughs> yes. Like this is not true guys. And the reason that that, that happened is because, there's like several Marys list, like talked about in the Bible. There's like actually like 14 Marys or something. There's so wow. many Marys. There's like a lot of Marys. And so there was a, a Pope in like the fifth century or something who was going through the Bible and was like, there's too many Marys. They must be the same person. Mm-hmm. Um, and so he kind of like reduced them down and, and like kind of smushed people together. And so he said that Mary Magdalene must have been this repentant prostitute. And so that's, it just came from him. And then we just kind of took it and ran with that for a long time. But what's really interesting, and this is only 50 pages into this book I'm reading, but we've already touched on it. Um, There is something about that that feels like maybe not intentional, maybe like these this Pope or these guys in the church, because a lot of the the doctrine that we believe in Christianity came from men sitting down and deciding what they believed. That's also a fact, <laughs> not making that up. Um, they, they kind of left out the feminine in a big way. And a lot of people theorize very intentionally because it would undermine the patriarchal structure of the Catholic mm. church that they were, they were establishing. And there is a gospel called the gospel of Mary Magdalene. And we also have two other Gnostic gospels, the gospel of Thomas and the gospel of Philip. And these were discovered in this 20th century, but basically in these Gnostic gospels, there were gospels written around the same time as the, as the four canonical gospels that we know, Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John, they were left out because they have a a different view of what happened. (laughs) Um, And they have a different kind of perspective and, Mary Magdalene is referenced se- several times in these gospels as the one that the apostle that Jesus most loved. 
and the apostle that um, he was the only one who actually got his teachings, Mm. that all these other apostles were struggling to like really get it. And she was the one who got it, who understood it, who adapted it and could teach it the way he wanted it to be taught. And so she really was not only his most beloved apostle, because there's a lot of people who theorize based on like, there's a line in there that they used to kiss each other on the mouth and like, okay, so there might've been, (laughs) there might've been erotic stuff there. There might've been love. There might've been like actual romance between them. And I love that idea, but who knows? We're probably never going to know. Dan Brown will tell you, yes. (laughs) Did you ever read the Da Vinci Code? I did. I did. I devoured Mm -hmm. it when I was a kid and yeah, it was fun. And then um, I didn't read any of the other one. I think I tried the second one and I, I got bored. Yeah. I got to say, he, he put out he put out a banger on that one. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> and that was very readable. <laughs> I read that very quickly. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, but like, we don't know. But the point is that, that Jesus truly loved her. And there was something about Mary Magdalene that she was able to understand these spiritual truths and teach them in a way that the other apostles couldn't yet and they were struggling but there's kind of insinuations that she's really it like Mm. she's she's the one that that gets it um and then she has her own gospel which is basically revealing the the um secrets that jesus told her that he didn't tell the other apostles because he knew they wouldn't understand yes um, and it, it is so fascinating. And I think that Mary Magdalene certainly figures as the sore mystica figure as well, because she is not only the, at least in this Gnostic tradition that we're unfolding right now, um, the most beloved and the most adept of the apostles to the teachings of Jesus, but she also continued them and continued to develop Jesus's ideas and say, well, what does this mean for us? How does this teach us how to live? The, the, what we're kind of guessing about the way that the, these Gnostic gospels are talking about her and what she could do and how Jesus appreciated her was that, she actually kind of was enlightened. Like she had achieved this sort of state of enlightenment and in a way that only Jesus himself also Mm. achieved. Mm. And so there's almost this companionship between them. It's almost like, of course, in the the Christian doctrine, Jesus is, is the son of God and Mary Magdalene is not the son of God or daughter of God. Like that's not, we're not taking it that far in the Christian context, but that she was companion to him and possibly even, you know, talk to him about what these ideas meant and developed this, this theology and developed this spiritual work. Um, and I, I love that idea. I am so, so excited by that. And I know we're in the realm of like, just kind of guessing and taking mm-hmm. big leaps, but I don't care because it's exciting. <laughs> it's exciting to think of it this way and to follow these breadcrumbs, um, and so I'm very, very thrilled to be going to see her Kate. Do you know the story of Mary Magdalene in France? I know that she was in hiding there. What was yeah. the deal? So mm-hmm. basically she fled after Jesus was crucified mm-hmm. and found herself in France. I don't remember how that happened. I'll find out when I go, I guess. You will. You're going to know so <laughs> I many will things. know so much. <laughs> um, but she, she hid in a cave for something like 30 years. Wow. Um, yeah. A Saturn cycle. Interesting. Mm-hmm. So she lived in this cave and the it was very sacred. And then the people have had like visions at this cave and whatever. And apparently her skull is there. Weird. Right? I know. I love it. <laughs> I hope that you feel a ghost when you go there. I'm expecting mm-hmm. to, honestly. Um, but yeah, so I think that that's another figuration of that Sora Mystica of the like, basically what the theme that we're kind of pulling out here is the like, the helper, the female or feminine helper, who actually wasn't as much as a, of a helper as she was a companion. Yeah. And like like working beside the, the alchemist or the spiritual figure. Yeah, totally. Um, completely random aside, have you ever seen the Scorsese Last Temptation of Christ? It's good. I think you should so. see it. Okay, I think good. I have. <laughs> I think you made me watch it one time. I think that I, I've – always asked you about it um i feel I really like, like i it. did i feel like i watched it with my well, husband it's willem dafoe as jesus yes yes mm-hmm. okay yes and then I, I watched it with my husband and he was like what in the world is this it's such a weird movie yeah <laughs> but i like his the relationship with uh with mary magdalene mm-hmm. in that um because they are like 
companions who mm-hmm. live together and she is like he of course rescues her from her prostituteness. Ugh. It's very melodramatic. But anyway, um for anybody who wants to see Jesus with a New York accent in the eyes of <laughs> Martin Scorsese, you can check out The Last Temptation of Christ. I think it's a great movie. It's really weird though. Or watch Jesus Christ Superstar. That's another good option. <laughs> Jesus Christ Superstar. <laughs> So I think, um, you know, yeah, I, I love just, again, the idea that, you know, the masculine requires the feminine, um, is something that exists in alchemy and Jung's thought. Um, and I think it's something that the world that we live in has like really forgotten and denigrated. And so one maybe more contemporary um, version of this feminine mystic who kind of was self-contained and didn't Mm -hmm. necessarily need the, um, the confirmation or the presence um, of the masculine um, is somebody who we're like jumping way ahead in history to consider, but it would be the painter and mystic Helma off Clint. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I kind of want to bring her in because she's to me so freaking fascinating. And there's actually some new art historical research about her that has literally just kind of surfaced that I learned about a couple of months ago and sent you a very, very frantic voice note about. So I loved it. (laughs) So Helma off Clint is, um, she was a Swedish artist and her dates are 1862 to 1944. And so she was most, I would say maybe innovative or, or like her career really got started in like the, late 1890s, early 1900s. Mm -hmm. And what's so remarkable about Hilma is that in terms of what we understand about art history, um, we know that people like Vasily Kandinsky, for example, we call him the father of abstract art or the father of abstraction. Mm -hmm. And it turns out, (laughs) go figure, (laughs) that Hilma off Clint and probably this other kind of gang of ladies, um, were way more pioneering and, um, you know, created abstract works way before these other, um, male painters did. Now I'm not here to bash male modernists. I love Kandinsky, you know, I'm not interested in doing that kind of takedown, but what's interesting about Helma to me is that she is someone who, um, you know, was quite independent. I think her whole life, um, she was basically an artist, an art student, and then her sister passed away when Mm -hmm. she was young. And that's what triggered her interest in something called spiritism, Mm -hmm. which is something that was really popular in the late like 1890s, um, that, you know, kind of brought in the use of, um, seances and believed in the reincarnated soul or spirit, very ghosty Mm -hmm. sort of, uh, practices. And it was a whole kind of spiritual revolution for a lot of people. Her sister's name, I believe was Hermia. And I Mm -hmm. think that that's interesting because that's, a correlative Hermes, like Mercury. Yeah. Right. That is super interesting. Brings us back to alchemy. Mm Mm-hmm. And so Hermia's death was the thing that triggered her interest in figuring out what happens to you after you die, which is like so sad and moving and beautiful. Um, And so, you know, after that, you know, around like 18, probably 1890, um, she started collaborating um, with other people. She went to art school and she met this woman named Anna Cassell. And They were definitely a couple. And that's one of those things that like art historians are slow, were slower to say. There was a documentary about her as early as or recent as 2019. And Mm -hmm. they didn't say that she That she had a girlfriend? (laughs) No. Okay. She didn't just have one girlfriend. She had many. um, (laughs) But this is is what I'm getting at. So, you know, she was part of this group called The Five. Mm 
And they were um, all women mystics who lived together and now we think are responsible for a lot of the works that we consider to be attributed to Hilma. So they would collectively hold a seance. They were all clairvoyant. They would all channel a message from the beyond. Um, And it was not like about you know, some random person who had passed away in their life. It was like God, they were trying to get in touch with, with God. Um, and they would create these amazing, um, abstract art pieces all about the dualities of light and dark. Like some of the most famous ones are these black and white swans that are kind of woven together. So good. A lot of geometric forms. And then a lot of like canvases with, kind of organic but geometric forms and then symbols from alchemy and from astrology and yeah. from numerology and stuff like that. So it's just fascinating. And um, what is interesting to me about this in relation to the Sora Mystica is that at the end of her life, um, or not probably at the end of her life, probably closer to just like middle age, she went to Rudolf Steiner and she was like, Hey, I made a series of paintings called paintings for the temple because she wanted to build a temple, but she didn't have the resources. Mm -hmm. And, um, she knew that he was building his own temple and was like, do you like my art? Like we have the same ideas. They were both interested in, um, in theosophy and, um, very influenced by Madame Blavatsky. And he just was like, ah, I don't think this is really good. I don't, mm. I'm not into this, which is ridiculous because yeah. they had the same philosophies. And if he didn't like them, I don't know. I want to say that he was threatened by her Shame and on Steiner. had too much of an ego to, to incorporate her. Um, and so she was rejected then by like the alchemist or by that, that, you know, animus figure. Yeah. And so she said, okay, screw that. I am going to, do nothing with my art and no one is going to be able to see it for like 20 years after I die. And, um, I'm going to keep this from the world and hope that my work finds the appropriate audience in a future generation. Um, and so all of this to say the Sora Mystica in this instance, um, channeling, you know, ideas about the soul and about the afterlife worked exclusively with a group of other women. So this group of the five uh, expanded to 13 women. Of course. For our 13th episode Mm -hmm. and became just this kind of like coterie of like probably polyamorous relationships. Everybody was with everybody else. And it's just this crazy thing to think that we have these amazing works. Um, It was amazing because art historians wanted to create this narrative that this woman was yet another sort of like hero figure in the art historical canon, this larger than life genius person who made these amazing paintings and they're huge canvases. They're gigantic. Um, And so now the idea that this is actually the product of a feminine mystic collective is really, really interesting to me. And so they were still channeling, maybe, you know, maybe their God has a a masculine tint to it, but this was the Sora Mystica to me in the presence of other Sora Mystica, to use your Latin from middle school or whatever. (laughs) (laughs) And I think that that is a really interesting transformation of that, you know, of the archetype itself. So, Yeah. um, yeah. That's gorgeous. I love I love Hilma's work so much. I only recently discovered it. You probably were the one who showed me something that got me onto it. Um, they talk about it in in Jungian communities all the time. Like oh, she's really? like one of their main artists that they uh, like to draw in and like you know apply to Jung's ideas because it, it connects yeah. so well. Yeah, so, I'm sure so it well. Does. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that we've had such a juicy and gorgeous conversation about about the Sora Mystica, about her significance and kind of, you know, looking at how she, we've kind of like a, a broken down the two capacities that she seems to fill. On one hand, the assistant, the guide, the person who kind of brings us to deeper mystical awareness. And on the other hand, um, a woman of, of mystical power in her own right. And so I really love that we've kind of been able to bridge both these sides. Yes. You're my Sora Mystica. You're mine. <laughs> Cool. (laughs) With all of that said, then, let's look at a symbol together. Yeah, let's do it. If you're enjoying this podcast, we encourage you to learn more about how you can support us on Patreon. 
There's many benefits available, including extended episodes, guided tarot meditations, and astrology transit journals. But all listeners are welcome to share a symbolic experience for us to explore on the show. Therefore, we invite listeners to pull those symbols from their lives, whether they come from a dream or synchronicity. Thank you to today's sharer, and please tell us your symbolic experience on our website, sorormysticapodcast.com. Are you a small business looking to reach a targeted audience of people who are interested in things like spirituality, esoterica, obscure academia, holistic living, magic, the occult, or other related topics? If this sounds like you, Sora Mystica would love to invite you to become an advertiser on our show. As Sora Mystica has a highly tailored audience of mindful, curious, depth-seeking listeners, we would be delighted to be able to give your business a place to reach new eyes, new ears, and new hearts. If you're interested in becoming an advertiser, you can find our application form at our website, which is sorormysticapodcast.com backslash advertise with us. Thank you so much for being a part of our listener community, and we really look forward to hearing more about your unique business quite soon. We want to let you know about a very cool spiritual small business that you should support. Vibes Del Alma focuses on creating a safe and nurturing space to tune into the vibes of your soul to live an authentic life. Vibes Del Alma will walk alongside you through sound therapy, intuitive card readings, and astrological consultations to find the song of your soul. This allows you to make space for the things that add value to your life while letting go of the things that don't. If you want to learn more, go to vibesdelalma.com or find them on Instagram under the handle vibesdelalma. So this symbol comes to us from a listener um, who says, When my Nana passed away, I went to a silent retreat at an abbey. I thought maybe I could find a connection with her here in the beauty of the mountains. I remember telling the group that I was here because of that reason during the opening ceremony. Later that afternoon, during reflection time, I looked out the window of my bedroom and saw a flower in the garden below. I said, Nana, if you're here, please send me a flower. A few hours later, the administrator of the retreat found me, told me to close my eyes, presented me with that same flower, and told me that my Nana wanted me to have it. It still gives me chills. Could the flower be a symbol? Mm. of course it is <laughs> you know it's so funny we chose this one just because it was so lovely um and then at, now i'm reading it this this woman just went on a silent retreat in abbey and yeah it's perfect retreat it's look at perfect. that synchronicity yeah. wow what a synchronicity mm-hmm. indeed my goodness mm-hmm. so my first question would be what flower is oh, it yeah. specifically because sure. that to me, okay. So number one, dear listener, yes, a thousand percent, this is going to be, um, an ally or something to look for, um, that symbolizes your grandmother's continued presence with you. And yeah. I think that what's exciting about, um, nature symbolism is that everything in the natural world connects to other, uh, has or other correspondences. So if it's a particular kind of flower and you can do a little research, it might be um, correlated with um, a particular God or a particular month of the year. Yeah. Maybe that speaks to your grandmother's like birth chart in an interesting way or um, some other characteristic that that plant, maybe that plant has medicinal functions and that's also something that you're supposed to take with you as a kind of healing tool. Um, Maybe you can incorporate it in food. Like there are many ways that flowers are so flexible, I think, in what they offer us. Um, And so I think that no matter where you are, having that flower in a particular um, in any, in any setting is always going to be a little high sign. So, yeah. yeah. I love that. It's a good sign too. I mean, I think that a lot of us have the signs from the beyond. Um, this is, this is spooky territory and I get spooked talking mm-hmm. about it, but, um, you know, after my grandfather died, my, every, everyone in my family kept seeing cardinals everywhere. And so now it became like a thing that that's, you know, grandpa's sign. Um, and, and everybody, you know, a lot of people have stories like that. It's like after someone passed away, there was some, there was some connection, some things, some symbol that they offered. 
I can't, I couldn't give you a better example of how, if, if your grandmother's spirit exists out there in the unknown and it trying, can communicate with you, that was her. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I'm very, I don't know. I don't know what happens in the afterlife. And my Aquarius brain is always like, stop pretending you do. So I always get nervous <laughs> saying yes, because I don't know. And then it's just spooky to me. But I think that if that's what you feel is very true and you know that that's true, then it is true because I believe mm. that that's entirely possible. Um, and I, I also think that the flower just generally, it's a symbol of beauty. It's a symbol of grace. Every, As Christine was saying, every flower has a slightly different symbolic element to it. Um, and I, I really love that idea of like pulling out a, a correspondence chart and just being like, where can I take this deeper? Um if it's lilies, we connect that more with like funerals, you know, death, uh, uh, purity. If it's roses, we connect that more with beauty and passion and love. Um, there's there's different sunflowers, you know, joy and and uh, brightness. So there's that might be something to consider and to look into what this particular flower has for you. But all flowers are symbols of something beautiful and something tender and something fragile but also um, always will always blossom. I was going to say there's like this renewal aspect to the flower in general. And so, um, you know, also staying attuned to like what time of year it was that that flower was picked and seeing that as like maybe an especially potent time of year to chat with your grandmother's spirit. Although I'm sure like, she's always around and listening and interested, Mm -hmm. but there are these, in my experience, things that can kind of key us into, you know, people that we love that we don't have in the physical anymore. So certain times of year, certain times of day, even when did you see that flower? You know, when were like, what time of day was it when you were looking out from your window? Um, and I love the idea too, of getting one of those flowers and having it like made into a piece of jewelry or something like that. Something yeah, talismanic. Yeah, I was going to say press it. I think that this is a really good example of the sign, the the synchronicity being so direct, and yet we still question it. And this is something that we all do, so mm-hmm. don't worry if you're like, ah, I should have trusted. No, I mean, we do that. That's part of what we do. And yet I still want to you know, encourage us all. One of the things that I always tell people about synchronicities is it's not about the thing, it's about the feeling. That is how you know. Mm. People are always like, wow, you emailed me at 1111. This must be meant, you know, I'm so excited for our reading (laughs) because, and I'm like, yeah, that's very nice. That's great. And maybe it it meant something big to you and it totally could be true. But the synchronicity is not like, wow, that's not what happens when we have a real synchronicity. Synchronicity is like, uncomfortable Mm -hmm. and it should feel a little uncomfortable we feel it in the body it's like there's this weird electricity that starts going and we're like there is something beyond me here (laughs) what is that thing it's a little bit uh, it's a little Mm -hmm. bit kind of strange but very very uh extraordinary at the same time and just reading this i could feel that from you uh dear listener so i would say like trust trust that that was exactly what it was the synchronicity a deep meaning for you. And it doesn't have to have some big meaning of like, oh my gosh, you know, here's your new destiny that you're you're being given. It's just, you've connected. I think it's so well put. Yeah. Sometimes it's just literally like we are connected to things that we can't see. Here's a little reminder of that. So Yeah. yeah, I think that's a great way of putting it. Yeah. Beautiful. All right. Well, I think that we've done a good job of covering the the Soror Mystica. We've, I think we've done her some uh, some justice here. And um, thanks everybody for listening. If you have a moment, we'd love for you to to let us know how you how you're enjoying the podcast. Yes, awesome. Thank you so much, everyone. Take care. Thank you for joining us in our conversation today. Please consider supporting the podcast by leaving a review and following Sora Mystica wherever you listen. You can also become a more active supporter and a member of the Sora Mystica community by joining our Patreon. If you have a symbolic experience that you'd like to share with us for the podcast, you can tell us all about it at sorormysticapodcast.com. 
The music for this podcast is written and performed by me, Mariana Lewis, with special thanks to Stefan Lewis. You can connect with both Christina and myself on Instagram and get to know our work by clicking on the links in the show notes. As the alchemical motto goes, as above, so below, as within, so without. May this ancient wisdom continue to guide you deeper. Until next time, take good care.